On episode 313 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Lee No and discuss his book, Mitochondria and the Future of Medicine. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 313. The sponsor for this podcast is Fresh Pressed Olive Oil. Now, these guys go out of their way to go find the freshest, best quality olive oil in the world, and they ship it directly to you. You can get a $39 bottle of their olive oil for $1 if you go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash olive oil. And you really do want to check this out because we're, we're all looking for ways to get more healthy fats into our diet, and olive oil is among the best. That is if you get good quality olive oil. That olive oil that you have in your cabinet that you've had around for a little while, well, one of the problems with olive oil is that it, as it sits around, it oxidizes and becomes somewhat rancid. So the quality of the olive oil is very, very important. The freshness of the olive, olive oil is very, very important. That's why you want to go with the best quality olive oil you can get and make sure you're getting a lot of it into your diet. So go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash olive oil. And you can get a $39 retail bottle of olive oil for just a dollar. Shipped to your home. This is some good stuff. Uh, I was talking to a client. He just got his bottle yesterday. And he was asking me for ways that he can utilize olive oil. And, and there's a lot. But this stuff is so good, I'll just literally just pour it on the salad. Now, occasionally, I'll mix the olive oil in with some vinegar or balsamic vinegar uh, to make a vinaigrette. Uh, but a lot of times, I just, I'll just pour it up, slather it over the salad and enjoy that. You can also use it for cooking if you do it at a very, very low heat. So some sautéing of this and that, some vegetables. Maybe you want to do some, some squash or some broccoli or something. A, a light sauté with it, not going to be a problem for you either. And then I'll use it in sauces and stews and soups and stuff like that. So like if I want to make a good marinara sauce, I'll, I'll make sure to include plenty of olive oil in there. Adds a really good flavor and, and makes just kind of makes the, the olive oil, uh, makes the marinara sauce a little bit more hearty and, and satiating because that's what fat does. Fat, fat actually is part of the satiation uh, when we're eating. So getting good quality olive oil uh, in your diet is important. So go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash olive oil to claim your $39 bottle, dollar bottle of olive oil for just a dollar. Again, that's 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash olive oil. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hello, and welcome to the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast. I'm really glad you're here, and I'm really glad that you're a part of the podcast. It has been a very, very busy week for me. One, and I've started working on the book that um, it's going to take quite some time to write, uh, as I'm finding out. Uh, it's quite an ordeal. Uh, but we also, we launched both of the challenges. So it's too late now, but we are have the ongoing squat challenge and the alcohol challenge. And if you're a part of the, those, either of those or both of those challenges, Thank you. Thank you for being a part of that. I really enjoy going through the challenges and interacting with you on a daily basis. Uh, so if you missed this one uh, or these just didn't appeal to you, come back next month. I'll, I'll have something else going on. Uh, so check back with us. But really enjoy doing the challenges and uh, really enjoy getting to know all of you as we go through the process of the challenge because it, it is an opportunity to really interact and, and spend some time and give you kind of a taste of, of what we're doing over here at 40 Plus Fitness Podcast. Uh, and the personal training. Uh, if you haven't checked out our training at all, I really would encourage you to go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash trainer. And on that page, uh, there's a video where I kind of talk a little bit about my path and, and what kind of led me to wanting to be an online personal trainer, what I get out of it. And it really is helping others find their health and fitness because our, our paths are very, very different. And finding that path is, is very, very important. And earlier in your life, you find it uh, the faster you find it, the better. Um, I spent a lot of time spinning my wheels trying to figure out this whole thing. Uh, and I, I'm not going to say I have it perfectly down. I'm, I'm learning new things every day. Uh, like in our conversation today uh, with Dr. Lee No, I learned so much from his book. And I, I, every, I pretty much every book I read, I, I'm able to learn something new, uh, which is really a joy for me. I love bringing that podcast to you. Um, and I'd love to work with you directly. So if you go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash trainer, I do a little kind of like mini podcast thing 
uh, which is another cool thing that I do as part of the membership. When you do join me as a group training or even as a one-on-one training, each week I do kind of a little mini podcast. It's about 15 minutes uh, where I'll talk on a topic. But the cool thing about that is they're actually in on the call. So with that conference call, then they can ask questions and whatnot. Uh, it's a recorded call, so I can basically then post it. So if you miss the call, you can always come back. So if you enjoy the podcast uh, and enjoy what I have to say, uh, I really do think you're going to enjoy the group training. That's my favorite part of the whole training is doing those little, uh, doing the conference calls every Saturday morning. There's it's really just a cool part of my day. It really kicks my weekend up a notch just feel like, uh, you know, I've done something <laughs> that's helping people and they're getting something out of it. And I really do appreciate that. So please do check it out. 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash trainer. Now our guest today is Dr. Lee No, and he's a naturopathic doctor in Canada. He has been an advisor for various companies in their research and he actually does it for himself. He has his own company, uh, but he really, really has drilled down into the mitochondria. And uh, the more I'm learning, the more I'm understanding that our health really begins at a cellular level. And the way our man, our mitochondria are working, they're the powerhouses of our cells. So if they're not functioning well, we have a problem. And, and it's not a problem that medicine can necessarily overcome. It really is something that we have to address from a lifestyle and health perspective. And Dr. No's book is excellent at giving us the guidance that we would need to manage that. And I try to pull out a lot of good nuggets. I know you're going to enjoy that. So with no further ado, here's Dr. Lee No. So Dr. No, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on your show. You know, uh, your book, Mitochondria and the Future of Medicine, you know, this title that's just going to kind of leap out at me because I, I really like to geek out on this stuff. And I, but I like how you took, I mean, a really, really complex topic uh, with a lot of even recent science on it. You know, science goes back a ways, but we're learning more and more about mitochondria and the importance of mitochondria every single day. So it's like, you know, to kind of go through your book and it's, it's funny because I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on recertifying for my personal trainer and I just finished the uh, chapter on bioengineerics, ah, energy, whatever. <laughs> right. uh, okay. I, I, yeah. I just, I just went through that chapter and, you know, they, they, they kind of gloss over the whole deal and they spend more time talking about the Krebs cycle and, uh, you know, other ways that we, how we provide energy. And they never even in the book said the word mitochondria. And I, it was like, oh, interesting. you know, yeah, they said the whole thing, what these cycles do and how it works from one to the other and APT and how you, you know, how this works and how that works and memorizing a few words here and there for the, for the test, but they actually never said the word mitochondria in the book. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Wow. Then I get in years and it's like, okay, let's, let's get into this. But you wrote it in such a way that I think someone kind of coming from that, that level of just understanding kind of the one-on-one of it can kind of get through and, and, and really learn a lot about what mitochondria is and what it does for us. Right. And I think that was uh, the purpose I had in mind when I when I set out to write the book is that it is a, an incredibly complex top, topic. And uh, e- even though I've written a book, I mean, I, I could continue to research one area of the mitochondria for the rest of my life. It's that complex. But I try to do it in a way that, you know, I, I there's just so much good information here. And the the relevance of mitochondria and mitochondrial function, as we find from the research is showing to be relevant to pretty much everything. So what I wanted to do is kind of bring that message to the general public in a way that they can understand it and not get, you know, too lost, uh, so to speak, in, in reading the book. Now, mind you, it is, uh, I, I do go into a bit of technical detail, but I tried my best in trying to keep, in, uh, trying to keep it at, at a more general level that everyone could kind of appreciate the importance of mitochondrial function. Yeah. And, and you were successful. I, I, like I said, as I went into it, I, I do geek out over this stuff at times, but you know, the reality of it was, it was something I felt like you didn't really have to have a deep understanding of what mitochondria is. Uh, if you just kind of go at it with the basic knowledge initially of that's the core way that our bodies create energy, the cells create energy, that's at a basic level. And then obviously you take it down and talk a little bit more detail about how that is, but can you kind of, kind of give us an overview of mitochondria why we have mitochondria and, um, you know, what it does for us. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start by kind of time traveling back to high school biology, which was a little while for, for, I think all, <laughs> for all, all of us. Yeah. Uh, myself <laughs> included. Yeah. But, uh, basically we, we learned about the mitochondria as one particular organelle in the cell and organelles to a cell are very similar to organs are uh, to what organs are to our body. They're distinct structures that carry out specialized function. So uh, just like the liver is a, a defined structure that carries out 
defined functions. Well, the, the, the organelles all have their own function as well. And for the mitochondria, its main function is to produce energy. Uh, and as you mentioned, the, the energy currency in our body, whenever we talk about cellular energy, we're really talking about ATP. And it is responsible for producing over 90% of the energy that our cells produce. And when you consider that everything that happens in a cell, that, that everything, and I, I, I could go into detail on, on that, but literally everything that happens, all the chemical reactions, all the transport of ions, everything that happens requires an input of ATP. And, and that's why the mitochondria is so critical to cellular function because it supplies over 90% of that energy. So anytime you have dysfunctional processes in that energy making process what ends up happening is you are not able to create the energy that your cells require and and then that's when things can start to fall apart yeah you know and, and i think that's that's kind of the critical thing is is just understanding that function and and what's cool in a way and you know it's hard it's hard to get somebody to study a way of eating at, with any kind of respect for a way of eating because as they kind of look at that, it's, there's no money in that. There's no science in that. But the science of mitochondria, there is some funding. There is some interest. There is some uh, more and more research. And so I kind of liked how you know in the book, as you got into it, the way people eat can affect their mitochondria, particularly when we start talking about things like ketosis and calorie restriction. Right. And intermittent fasting, all that stuff kind of ties in really nicely. Once you start to understand the importance of mitochondria, but also how it functions and the different factors that govern its function and efficiency, then you can start to kind of take all these other pieces that other people have heard of, whether it's, you know, certain uh, dietary regimes or exercise or different supplements. And you can, you can kind of start to fill in the, the picture and understand why these things happen. And I think that's one of the, 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 the important things is that I'm trying to get across in the, in the book is to give an understanding of the why, because as you said, going into ketosis is typically seen as a uh, nutritional ketosis is a, a, a healthy thing for most people. But unless you know why, you know, it, it there's, you might fall off the bandwagon or you, you not, might not be even that motivated to undertake that type of uh, dietary regime in the first place. So having that why and understanding the, the topic a little bit deeper, I think uh, gives people the, the tools that they need to kind of empower themselves and get get going with these types of uh, protocols. Okay, well, now you've you've opened up that Pandora's box. So why, <laughs> uh, you know, because I I do cyclical ketosis, I, seasonal, I guess is a better way to say it. I will be yeah. in ketosis for parts of the year, and then I go out of ketosis. Uh, I don't have a, an illness like diabetes or anything like that, a heart disease, those types of things that a lot of people will use ketosis to kind of manage. But there there are some legitimate benefits and for the folks that you know have cancer have diabetes alzheimer's those types of things there there are some core benefits they can get from being in ketosis all the time but if someone is reasonably healthy is not in one of those condition states at this point is it something that we should consider based on what you know about mitochondria mitochondria Yes, absolutely. And you know what, first of all, I I want to go back to what you're saying in terms of the, the the amount of research that's coming out is that when so I um the first edition of this book was published back in 2014 and it took me about uh, four and a half years to write and so I started this you know say in 2010 and at that time I went to PubMed which is an online database that indexes all the peer-reviewed medical journals and uh, I set up a search criteria for mitochondria so anything related to the mitochondria I would get an, uh, a weekly notification and it would list all the different artic- uh, peer-reviewed articles that were were indexed to that database over the, the past week and on a weekly basis since you know 2010 and probably it was going on before that i was getting on average about 300 journal articles sent to me on a weekly basis now mind you most of that was not necessarily clinical trials or things like that and a lot of it were were was review articles but that just kind of illustrates the the amount of research that's being done so what we're seeing is a rapid increase in our understanding of how the mitochondria functions, the different uh, biochemical pathways that are involved, all that stuff is really starting to kind of um, come into its, its, its own, uh, so to speak. And, and when it comes to things like ketosis, we're starting to, uh, and ketogenic diets, we're starting to really understand the, the benefit of these types of diets to the function of mitochondria. And then one of the, uh, the other thing I should mention is that when we look at mitochondrial function and what 
its dysfunction means, we're starting to see that mitochondrial dysfunction is essentially at the root or at least a, a main aggravating factor in pretty much all age-related degenerative diseases, as well as a host of other uh, illnesses as well. So when you, when you look at the benefit of ketosis and ketogenic diets, you can start to understand why, you know, like, like you said, uh, individuals with uh, diabetes or Alzheimer's, uh, cancer, things like this would want to kind of undergo a, a, a dietary program like this because there is just so much benefit to allowing mitochondria to function in a way that doesn't require its primary fuel source. And so uh, just going into, you know, the, the basics, our mitochondria likes to start uh, producing energy through glucose. Uh, so it goes through the first stage of uh, energy production called glycolysis. Then it goes into the Krebs cycle, as you mentioned uh, in, your, in your recent studies. And then it goes into the electron transport chain and, and it produces energy. Now, fats and proteins can also kind of contribute a little bit to, to energy. Actually, fats do in, in many cases do contribute a very significant portion of that energy. But in a situation where our bodies are not able to metabolize glucose and carbohydrates, we need an alternative source of fuel. And where it becomes particularly important in the brain, especially because uh, in the rest of our body, uh, fats are a primary source of fuel and we can metabolize those quite readily as long as we have the proper nutrients. But when it comes to the brain, and one of the reasons why I think something like ketosis is receiving a lot of interest in, from the research community with respect to Alzheimer's is that the brain, um, for the longest time, was thought to be critically dependent on blood glucose. And that's one of the reasons why our bodies maintain blood glucose levels within a very narrow range, because our, our brains need a, a very constant source of blood glucose. But in the situation where our brains are no longer able to use that glucose, and this is it, it un, unofficially been termed um, type 3 diabetes or insulin resistance in the brain. So, you know, the blood glucose is there, but our, our brain cells are not able to use it. Uh, and in those situations, an alternative source of fuel becomes uh, critical. And that's where, you know, we go into ketosis, we burn a lot of fat uh, of the energy it basically shuts down and that's when the symptoms of Alzheimer's come in. If you're able to use ketone bodies as a source of fuel, you wake up those brain cells. And in some case studies, we've seen people go from, you know, uh, being completely dependent on caretakers uh, because they have advanced forms of Alzheimer's to essentially be given a, a new lease on life where they're, they're operating on a day-to-day -day basis independently again. So, uh, again, with ketones offering that the, the brain cells an alternative source of fuel, it, it it just allows everything to work better. And that's you know just going back to the way that um, you mentioned your eating, where you uh, at certain times of the year you go in, go into ketosis. That's how our bodies actually evolved. Our bodies were never meant to have a steady or uh, or shouldn't, I shouldn't say never meant, but we never evolved in a situation where we had constant supply of of food and high carbohydrate food. We would go through periods of famine, little carbohydrate fat and produce ketones. And like I said, over, over time, we've evolved to be able to efficiently use those alternative sources of fuel. So it's actually what, uh, you know, going back to our, our ancestral roots, it's pretty much more in line with what our bodies evolved with. Yeah. And that's actually the logic of why I, I went into it that way was knowing that uh, that's because my, um, my ancestry, you know, I did the, the DNA testing and it's, it's all North, Northern and Europe, uh, Eastern European. So there's, there's nothing else there, but that as far as my DNA, I guess, other than the 2.6% Neanderthal, but, uh, you know, I, I, I figure, you know, during the winter months up there, they're, they're not going to be eating too much fruit at all. And so, you know, there's right. what they, what they mm -hmm. can get ha their hands on, which is mostly maybe some leafy greens from time to time and then pre predominantly animal products and fat. So, right. yeah, so yeah. that's, that's, that's a big reason why I, I tend to eat that way. And, and, and my body seems to respond very well to it. One other area though, that I, I just found fascinating because I have a, a lot of clients that'll sit there and say, you know, I want to lose weight, but I'm, I don't want to ruin my metabolism. And so I, how many calories should I be eating? And I always tell them, you know, eat enough where you feel your energy levels where you want it to be and you're getting good nutrition and then full stop. You know, your body will tell you uh, when it's satiated, if you're eating right and eating the right foods, when we cut, cut calories, like I'll have a client that told me, you know, he, he was tracking his calories and he ate about 800 calories 
and he was full. He said he just really couldn't eat anymore, didn't feel like eating more. His energy level was fine. He was just concerned that he was going to uh, enter starvation mode. Can you talk a little bit about what calorie restriction does for us, what it means to our metabolism and uh, longevity? Yeah. Okay. So again, when you look at the way that the mitochondria function and its role in aging and longevity. And mind you, I should also point out, and I mentioned this uh, in my book, is that at this point, it, it appears that the mitochondrial theory of aging is the most evidence-based and supported uh, theory of aging that we know of. So it's replaced uh, the, you know, the free radical theory of aging, which itself replaced the wear and tear theory of aging. So you, you can kind of, if, if you've heard of these other types of uh, theories of aging, you can kind of put the, the latest mitochondrial theory of aging into context of in, into time and in, into the chronological timeline. But basically we're, what we're seeing is that it's mitochondrial function that really dictates our, our, our longevity. So when you look at uh, things like calorie restriction and how that fits in, and I should also mention that calorie restriction is, is really the only proven way that we can extend lifespan uh, across every species that, that we've ever studied. So what we're what, what I mean by that is the maximum theorized lifespan of a particular species is usually we thought to have been dictated by you know certain factors like our, our genes. But now what we're seeing is that um, a lot of that does come into play with respect to mitochondrial function. We can actually extend lifespan uh, further than what we typically thought. And, and calorie restriction is the only one that's consistently shown life extension. Now, I also want to point out that I'm talking about life extension in, in nor, uh, you know, more or less healthy individuals, because there are other ways to extend your, your life, so, uh, so to speak, when you're sick. So, you know, if you're, if you have a particular health condition, you can take uh, certain supplements or drugs that would help minimize negative impacts of that particular disease condition. But when we're talking lifespan, that's a different, different story. We're talking about the maximum theoretical lifespan in years for a particular species. And, and whether we're talking single-celled yeast to worms to mammals to even primates, calorie restriction has been shown to extend lifespan. So how this works is that the mitochondria is now considered the greatest source of endogenous free radicals. So the, the, the mitochondrial theory of aging essentially says the only free radicals that are important in disease and longevity are the ones that are created within the mitochondria. So all those other exogenous sources of free radicals that we might get from, you know, our diet or the environment, things like that. Well, they, they might have a negative impact to certain uh, disease conditions or increase your risk of certain diseases. But when it comes to aging, really the only ones that matter are the, the free radicals generated within the mitochondria. And uh, like I said, it is Anytime we're breathing oxygen, there is a potential of that oxygen creating free radicals in the in the mitochondria. Uh, and what happens is that the oxygen combines with the electrons that flow through the electron transport chain. So without getting too technical, as long as the electrons are uh, flowing through the electron transport chain uninhibited, it can reach the end. And the end is a uh, complex called complex four. And at that point, uh, we can take that electron enzymatically reacted with the oxygen and create water. In a situation where we have too many electrons, uh, so to speak, or too few complexes relative to the electrons, those electrons can spill out. So essentially what we're looking at uh, is a situation very similar to, say, a subway station or a train station where, you know, each subway station can only hold one train. For the next train to come in, the previous train has to has to leave, and that's just very very similar to these complexes in the, in the electron transport chain, where they uh, they're occupied by an electron, and for the next one to come in, that electron has to be passed off to the next component in the in the chain. In a situation where we have have eaten too many calories relative to what our electron tra transport chains can handle. That essentially means that as we digest our food and it breaks down it, and it essentially turns into electrons at the cellular level, that means we have a, a rush of all these electrons trying to cram into the electron transport chains. And like I said, we need the previous electrons to leave those stations before new ones can come in. If those new ones come in when the uh, station is already occupied, 
well, we're going to have a crash, so to speak, and those electrons are going to fall out, prematurely react with oxygen. So not at complex four, we're, we're reacting this, these electrons with oxygen prior to complex four. And in this situation, we, we create superoxide free radicals. And that can be a dangerous situation because those free radicals are generated within the immediate proximity of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so the mitochondria does have its own set of DNA, which is critical for the function of the, the mitochondria. And if we damage that DNA, you know, the, the protein building blocks and things like that, that are coded by the mitochondrial DNA are not able to be built properly. And then energy, uh, the whole energy making process kind of falls apart. So the, so I, I know I've <laughs> taken a, a really long winded way to explain calorie restriction, but uh, the way calorie restriction works is you're eating fewer calories, which equals fewer electrons. And over time, uh, this essentially means that there are less free radicals being generated at the level of the mitochondria, fewer damage to the, um, to the mitochondrial DNA, and therefore your, your mitochondria are able to stay healthy longer. And as I mentioned, because mitochondria is seen as the, 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 the biological clock, so to speak, Healthier mitochondria essentially means a healthier life. And what we're seeing is that it's just not healthier life and longer lifespan, but all those degenerative diseases that typically start to occur in, uh, after our middle age years, those are delayed. So they're kind of pushed back. So if we were, you know, if we typically think, you know, by the time we're in our 50s or 60s, we've developed certain health conditions in a calorie restricted scenario, we might be able to push that. 10 years down the road. So, you know, we might look at getting those uh, instead of in the 50s and 60s, 60s and 70s, so to speak. So yeah, there, there are a lot of good benefits to calorie restriction. But again, you have to do this properly because there is a difference between calorie restriction and starvation or malnutrition. So the idea is to reduce calories, but to make sure that our nutrient intake is sufficient to meet our needs. Yeah. And, and it makes sense if you think about it from an ancestral perspective, because, you know, there'll be periods of time when, you know, we just the, the crops weren't there. The animals didn't come back in the same numbers. And so you, you needed help people to stay healthier longer to be productive because, uh, you know, having 20 people out there hunting versus 18, because the, the two oldest ones just weren't fit to do it this season. It makes sense that it, as a, as a species that we would adapt to a point where, where during those periods of time of restriction, our bodies would be doing things to make us as strong and, and resilient as we can be. So we can provide for ourselves and, and for our tribe. Right. So it, I think it's really important. And, I, and one of the kind of key things that came up and as we kind of talk about, you know, calorie restriction and these other things is the, the mitochondria need certain nutrients to be successful. And you go into the book into some of them. And the one that was fascinating me, because I, mean, I, I know about the B vitamins, you know, if you're a vegetarian, you might not be getting B12. So, you know, they typically have to supplement with that. But I didn't realize is that D ribose is something that we would potentially want to supplement with when we were doing ketosis. And so can you kind of get into some of the core ones? Because, you know, it's creatine and coenzyme Q10. Those are things that I've, I've heard of and, and have used at points in time. I actually started taking creatine again after I read your book. <laughs> but uh, can you kind of talk about those other supplements and, and some of the supplements that we would want to consider, particularly if we're doing the calorie restriction and we want to make sure we're getting proper nutrition? Yeah, so d ribose is, is one of those ones that really jumps out at me. Um, not only is it... An amazing nutrient uh, to begin with or a supplement to begin with for, for anyone that's concerned with energy levels and mitochondrial health, but it becomes particularly important for anyone undergoing any sort of carb restriction or nutritional ketosis program because, so first of all, D-ribose, its function in the body is to, uh, it, it's a building block for the adenosine molecule. So when we talk about ATP, which is the energy currency in our body, it's an adenosine molecule with three phosphates. So adenosine triphosphate, that's what ATP stands for. So that adenosine backbone to which those three phosphates get attached to, that is critically dependent on the availability of D-ribose. Now, our bodies, and the reason why D-ribose is not considered a vitamin in the truest sense is that our bodies actually produce D-ribose. Uh, so it's not an essential nutrient that we have to get from our diet. But even though our bodies are able to make it, and it makes it from glucose, it's a very, very slow process. In fact, uh, in any situation where we have an energy deficiency, it's very difficult to 
improve our energy stores or the, the, the energy capacity in our bodies without supplemental D ribose. And that just illustrates how slow our bodies make D ribose. In a situation where you're cutting out carbs, however, and going into nutritional ketosis, the availability of glucose is not there. So, and if there is glucose, you know, the small amount that you will get from your diet, it's in such short supply that our bodies actually use it as a, as a source of energy before it considers using that as a, as a building block to, to build more D ribose. So what ends up happening is, and I won't say that everyone that's going through nutritional ketosis uh, requires this, but I think it's definitely a strong consideration for, for almost everyone and, and for a smaller group where they have uh, possible mitochondrial dysfunction or uh, insufficient energy levels, it, I think it becomes much more like a vitamin where it becomes an essential nutrient that you have to get from external sources. Uh, and, and that's because our bodies, as I mentioned, will not be able to have access to that glucose to build D-ribose where, and, and uh, D-ribose external sources become increasingly important. The other thing I want to mention, and the reason why D-ribose is more important for certain individuals than others, is that anytime you have an energy deficiency and your body is not able to produce as much energy as your body or those cells demand, it goes through a different process of energy production called the adenylate kinase reaction. And this is where it takes two ADPs. So just to kind of give the, the overall picture, when we use ATP, so the energy molecule ATP, and we use that to produce uh, or uh, we extract the energy to use that energy, uh, the leftover compounds is, uh, are what we call ADP or an adenosine diphosphate. So an adenosine molecule with two phosphates and that third phosphate ion kind of floating around. In order for us to regenerate ATP, we have to have that ADP and phosphate base. So uh, that cycle can continue to happen. In a situation where individuals cannot meet the energy demands of, of the cell, uh, fast enough, what our bodies do will kind of take a shortcut and combine two ADPs uh, to create one ATP and one AMP or an adenosine monophosphate. So the great thing is, is that we end up with an ATP that our bodies can use for energy, but then we end up with this AMP. And that AMP is not something that the cell wants to keep around. It's actually considered waste and a, a toxic material. So it actually wants to get rid of it. So and that's exactly what it does. It gets rid of it. It's, it gets pushed out of the cell. The unfortunate thing with that scenario, however, is that we are moving the adenosine molecule out of the cell and then we'll flush it out of our body. So what we end up happening is uh, we have a smaller capacity in, within the cells in the mitochondria to produce energy. So because we're losing that, that, uh, that adenosine molecule. And really in those types of situations, the only way to really get our bodies back to a point where we have sufficient capacity and sufficient adenosine molecules really to use that supplemental D ribose. And so that's one of the reasons why I think D ribose for anyone that's concerned with energy levels is one of the primary considerations when it comes to supplementation. Yeah, so that that's pretty much particularly so now if we're getting into ketosis or we're doing any kind of intermittent or extended fasting, this is a supplement we should we should be taking probably. Right. Yeah, and you know what one of the things that we've we've seen in studies is that if you prime your cells with with D ribose and you unexpectedly experience a cardiovascular event like um, you know a heart attack or uh, or a stroke and I won't get into it you can uh, you know your 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 listeners can read read my book but essentially what we're doing is we're we're kind of creating this extra cushion that prevents excessive damage in in cases of a heart attack and a stroke so it, it's one of those things that can come in, uh, can really come uh, in handy um, as we age and we're at greater risk of you know, having these uh, unintended events, uh, having enough D ribose in our body will kind of uh, blunt the negative uh, impact or make, you know, those events probably less serious than they otherwise would have been. Okay. And then uh, coenzyme Q10 is something I, I've, I've known for heart health for quite some time, and I do it occasionally uh, supplement with it. Can you tell us a little bit about how that affects mitochondria? Yeah. So this, so when we talk about nutrients from the mitochondria, most people would probably think coenzyme Q10. It's, it's one of the most well-researched natural therapeutic ingredients that are out there, incredibly safe and incredibly useful. And the reason why it's so important to mitochondrial health is that it is a component 
of the electron transport chain. So, you know, out, out of the Krebs cycle or, or the trigarboxylic acid cycle, we have energy molecules that get that get fed into the electron transport chain. And those energy molecules enter at complex one or complex two. And both complex one and complex two will pass off their electrons to coenzyme Q10, which then delivers the electrons over to complex three. So you can see that not only is CoQ10 a critical component of the electron transport chain, but if you're, if you're to just visualize a schematic of the electron transport chain and you were to identify a bottleneck, it really is the availability of co- coenzyme Q10 that, uh, that would be the, the bottleneck, simply because it's really receiving electrons from two different complexes. So the idea with CoQ10 is you need essentially an excess amount of, of CoQ10. I've read um, other, other authors and other study studies where the, the um, research have basically concluded having just enough CoQ10 is not enough. We really want an excessive amount laying around, you know, for the most part, you know, just laying back, not doing much. But yeah. in situations where we need to ramp up that energy production, we really want to be able to ensure that our bodies have access to excessive amounts of coenzyme Q10 yeah. so we can adequ- adequately remove those electrons from complex one and complex two. And continue so to, so to, go, to, go to, your, uh, to go back to your uh, subway analogy, we want more cars on the subway so everybody's not crammed into the cars that are there but can sit comfortably around the different subway cars, even if there are excess cars to people. We want those excess cars to make the ride a little bit easier. That's right. And f- more frequent uh, trains coming through the, the, the station as well. So instead of, you know, hanging out at the station for five minutes, uh, we, we want it in, load it up, get it out uh, and do that repeatedly. Uh, so that's the idea with uh, with cookie 10. OK, cool. So L-carnitine, which is uh, I believe that's an amino acid, right? It is. Yeah. OK. And that one's very important as well. It is. Now, uh, so both with, uh, you know, all, all these things that we've talked about, none of them are really considered vitamins, again, because our bodies actually create these nutrients. So CoQ10 as well as L-carnitine. Now, L-carnitine, however, is an interesting uh, amino acid. It's, it's not a protein building amino acid, but it's, it's, uh, it serves other functions. And its main function is to transport long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria. So going back to, you know, our, the, the different types of fuel that our bodies prefer to use, our cells prefer to use fats as a source of fuel, and that's simply because they're so dense in energy. Uh, the problem is, is that 99 to 100% of the fatty acids that a typical Western individual would consume, uh, sorry, a typical person on a Western diet would, would consume, 99 to 100% of those are long-chain fatty acids, and they cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane without a transporter or, or a helper, and that's what L-carnitine does. So L-carnitine is the transporter that takes long-chain fatty acids, the, which are the primary preferred source of fuel for the mitochondria, and allows, that to, allows those fatty acids to enter the mitochondria where they can actually be burned and used uh, to create energy. Uh, with, without L-carnitine, we would really only be able to use short-chain and medium-chain fatty acids. And that, as I say that, you're probably starting to understand the reason why when we go into things like our, a ketogenic diet, one of the reasons why things like medium chain fatty acids are so valuable is because, you know, it can enter the mitochondria directly without the need for a transporter. But unless you're, you know, taking certain NCT oils or coconut oil, things like that, like I said, the vast majority, if not 100% of your fatty acids will be long chain fatty acids. So your body can only u- utilize them in the presence of L-carnitine. Okay. Now I supplement with magnesium because it, it helps me sleep better. So, you know, if I know that uh, maybe my energy levels are not there, I'm not feeling very well, uh, not getting good rest, I'll, I'll start a regimen where I'll start supplementing with magnesium and it, it typically helps me sleep better. But it also, there's a, there's a, an, a benefit to the mitochondria, which may actually be the same benefit. Uh, could you go into that? Yeah. So, so one of the things with magnesium, um, first of all, it's, it's, the studies have shown that the vast majority of individuals are actually not getting enough magnesium. The importance of magnesium is that it's involved in over 300 biochemical reactions, many of those related to energy production, as well as when we talk about ATP, you know, that those three phosphates at, that make up uh, the, the phosphate tail on, on an ATP molecule, it's actually stabilized by an by an ion of magnesium. So when we talk about ATP, we're really talking about magnesium ATP. 
And so without magnesium, our, our body's ability to utilize ATP is just not there. And the idea is that that magnesium stabilizes that third phosphate so that, you know, it's still there when our bodies need it. It just doesn't randomly just break off uh, and, and kind of make that that energy that was contained in that third bond kind of just dissipate into the cell. So it's really important for many aspects of, of energy production. But going back to, you know, what you said about uh, using it to sleep, well, magnesium is one of those minerals that is also very important for um, re- muscle relaxation. So in our, in our muscle cells, we, we have a protein called a calcium magnesium ATPase. And not only does it require ATP, for this enzyme to work, but it also requires magnesium. And what this particular enzyme does is it pumps calcium back out of the cell into its storage form called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is what initiates muscle relaxation. So if uh, you know, you're know you deficient in magnesium, your muscles are going to be more tense uh, and you're not, able, you're not going to be able to relax as well. And that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people do use magnesium to help them relax at night and try to you know get a good, good night's rest. Cool. Now, creatine is one of those uh, things that's been around for quite some time. Uh, I've done some episodes on creatine. Uh, It is a supplement that I use from time to time, not so much for the muscular energy benefit, you know, when I want to work out and, you know, it kind of pumps up your muscle, makes you feel a little bit better about yourself. But there are some huge benefits to the brain and to the body and the mitochondria from creatine. Can you kind of get into that? Yeah. So I I know, I think, this is one of the, the nutrients that is in my book that I think a lot of people are surprised to see it because for, for many individuals that have heard about creatine, they think of it as a sports nutrition supplement that you know bodybuilders will use or elite athletes will use. But when you look at the way it works, it does have benefits to you know athletic individuals, uh, but the way it works is through the mitochondria. So it's going to have benefits to many different uh, other health conditions. Uh, and that's exactly what the newer research is showing. So you mentioned musculoskeletal uh, benefits, uh, heart health, and even brain health uh, benefits. And really, this boils down to the fact that creatine is is um, somewhat of a, a storage form of phosphate. So I, again, we need multiple components to create ATP. Um, the the ribose that we talked about would be uh, an ideal situation uh, uh, supplement to use to help build that adenosine component. But we also need that phosphate uh, component and creatine as phosphate creatine uh, is our our storage form, so to speak, of of that phosphate. And it's a readily available source of phosphate. So as our bodies break off that phosphate uh, to use ATP, it needs to be um, replenished quickly. And, uh, you know, we do have dietary sources of phosphate, things like that. But as long as if we have phosphate creatine right there in the immediate proximity of where that energy is being used and we can donate another phosphate uh, very quickly, uh, energy production happens a lot faster. And again, because everything that happens in the cell requires energy, everything will just start to work better. And that's exactly what we see uh, in the brain, muscles, and the heart. Yeah. Now, the final one I want to talk about, because there are others uh, that we won't have time to get into, but the B vitamins, I think, are, are one of those other things. Like I said, uh, vegetarians often don't get enough B12 uh, because it's just not readily available in their food source and they, they should be supplementing uh, with it. But B vitamins are also typically water soluble. So they're going to wash through our bodies a lot faster. So we may not be getting enough B vitamins from our food, particularly in certain parts of the year. Can you talk about the B vitamins and why they're important to mitochondria? Yeah. So B, B vitamins are essentially cofactors in many different biochemical processes. And one of um they're all important. So as an example, B12 is used as a component of one of the, the, the complexes. Other B vitamins will catalyze other reactions. One, one of the ones that really stick out for me with respect to B vitamins and mitochondria health is vitamin B3. And that's because B3, its main function is actually is to be the precursor of uh, an energy molecule called NAD plus or NA, as well as NADH. And NAD physiology um, and the balance of NAD and NAD plus in, in a particular cell has tremendous benefits to an individual. So one, one of the things that we're starting to realize, uh, and this is, uh, you know, w- there, are, there are companies developing very specific and unique uh, forms of B3, as well as others creating stabilized versions of NAD, uh, NADH as a supplement. 
idea here is to really kind of get that NAD level up in our bodies. It's actually how as we actually turn on and turn off certain genes that promote health, or sorry, turn on certain genes that promote health, turn off um, certain g- genes that uh, promote illness. And that is really one of the things that B3 does. B2 is also interesting because B2 is a component of complex two. B5 is a component of co- uh, coenzyme A, which is another en- uh, an important energy molecule. So you can see that they, they all serve a very important function when it comes to energy production and mitochondria health, but in different ways. So uh, it's not a matter of just getting one B vitamin over the other. Uh, having a, a good B complex that gives a good balance of all, all of them is, is going to be important. Cool, cool. So Dr. Note, thank you so much for being a part of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast. It's been a pleasure. I, I really enjoyed your book, Mitochondria and the Future of Medicine. It's written in a way that, you know, we can get really, really deep here. And there's a lot more in the book than we covered in a short podcast. But the reality is it's written for just about anybody that wants or is interested in knowing not just the how, but the why for mitochondria and our health and our longevity. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. My pleasure, Alan. Thank you for having me. Now, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, learn more about the book, learn more about you, where would you like for me to send them? I have a website. Uh, it's just leeno.com. It really is just uh, just get a little bit of information about me and the book. But it, that it also contains my my contact information. So if you have any questions or I, I'm not in a in a position to to make uh, specific recommendations to anyone. But uh, of course, one of the things that uh, I, I do like is hearing from everyone. And if you just need you know some some basic guidance, uh, by all means, you can give me a, a quick email and I can do that. But again, I'm not going to be making any specific recommendations or prescriptions but uh, or, or diagnoses, but yeah. um, but my contact information is there for some, some more minor uh, situations. Okay. And this is going to be episode 313. So you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 313, and you can find the link to Dr. No's site there and any other contact information. So again, Dr. No, thank you so much. And in letting you go, I have to say this, may the force be with you. (laughs) Thanks. And may the force be with you as well. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do go give us a rating and review on iTunes and subscribe. It really does help get the podcast out there. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash review, and that will take you to the iTunes page where you can go ahead and open up iTunes and leave us a rating and review. I really appreciate it. I read each and every one of them, and I appreciate everyone that's already done this. But if you haven't, please go give us a rating and review. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Fred Bartlett and discuss his book, Strong Path. I mean, this guy's in his 80s, and he's sharp as a tack. Really enjoyed this conversation with him, and I know you will too. Until then, have a happy and healthy day.